G'day Art Snackers, my name is James of James Luke Burke Creative and welcome back to another month of Art Snacks Box Freestyle where we take the supplies from the October 2021 Art Snacks Plus Box, experiment with them to within an inch of their lives and then hopefully create a masterpiece for the hashtag Art Snacks Challenge. Sounds easy, right? Okay, I just want to say, fun fact, I love glitter. I don't think this is a surprise to anyone that knows me, but I'm obsessed with glitter. Anything shiny, anything reflective, I just love glitter. And in this lifetime, I would just... I would be so happy if I could get my hands on a home printer that could print glitter. If you're a printer developer, you're an engineer and you can make that happen, please let me know. <laughs> um, also, if I'm putting requests in, I'd love it if you could print metallic fluorescence and um, white ink as well. So I'm just gonna put that out there, see what happens. Anyway, let's get stuck into the October box, see what we've got to play with today. Here is the October 2021 Art Snacks Plus box. Here's everything inside. Unwrap that little green burrito and this is what we'll be playing with today. First up in the Plus box, the Legion Paper Lennox Cotton Paper Pad 9x12, 250 GSM and there's 15 sheets in there. In the Plus box we also have the King Art Inkline Fine Line Ink Pens, a set of six, all the way from 005 up to 08. We have the Liquitex Professional Acrylic Ink. I got a bottle of fluorescent orange, very appropriate for Halloween. A Winsor & Newton Professional Watercolor Synthetic Sable Brush. I have size three. The Kuretake Zig Higashiyama Manga Liner. I have a metallic green in extra fine. And we also have the Mitsubishi Uni High, oh, High Uni <laughs> Pencil, as well as the sticker and the snack. Let's set everything up and get to playing. Okay, it's time to experiment with our supplies. You know for the pencils, I typically just do a whole lot of scribbles, but there is a bit of method to my madness. <laughs> I'm kind of testing the texture I can get just straight from the pencil. I wanna test how light and dark I can make the pencil. I also wanna test how it smudges and erases. All of those things are always important for me to know, especially when I'm using a pencil that I'm not always familiar with. I have obviously used many, many pencils over my time, but I find myself always gravitating towards an HB or a 2B just for different things, um, and then switching between a regular pencil and a mechanical pencil. This was a nice classic feeling pencil. Um, it also looks really beautiful with that lacquered wood, but it was really interesting to use a B because I actually found that it was kind of the perfect midway point, shock horror, um, of the HB and the 2B. And it just hadn't occurred to me before that maybe I could eliminate the need to switch between them and have a pencil just like that to use. So that was actually kind of interesting for me. I know it's really only relevant to my preferences because I like the HB and 2B, um, but I thought I would just point it out. This is actually probably a really good midway pencil if you're looking for something that's not too hard, not too soft. It can make really nice light lines and, uh, and you can do some nice under sketching, but you can also get some great depth out of it as well without having to, you know, scribble through your paper <laughs> and try and press down too hard. Um, it, the B was actually really nice. I like that. So here I'm testing out the inks. I've also diluted a lot of the orange acrylic ink as well, just to see what kind of a range of tones I could get. As I scrub over those dry swatches, you'll see just how waterproof they are. I think the green might even be a touch of a, a resist because it seems to, the orange seems to be avoiding that green a little bit in the puddle. Um, but they were very, very waterproof once dry. And obviously that orange, very vibrant very appropriate and so lucky to get a green because it was giving very much pumpkin so <laughs> I was happy about that. My little uh, accidental swipe, not so accidental, <laughs> but swipe through the puddle of that orange made me question whether I should try and dip that pen into water and I found a lovely little gradient pen effect to uh, you know, kind of go from clear into gray into black. I thought that was really fun. We don't really have supplies that do that naturally. So this is where those experimentations can kind of lead you into you know, using a supply in a way that it's maybe not really intended, uh, but has an extra function that we could benefit from if we needed that. I don't think it's a regular day at your art table that you would need a gradient pen like that, but who knows? I mean, I see some practical effects for patterning. I see some practical effects for maybe ghosts even because they're kind of, you know, clear and also defined. Like they move, th you'll get what I mean. There may be a, a reason to know that that skill or that that option exists and it's always good to 
be so playful in these moments so that we can find that out. Also, I mean, I did it, I found that out through running through the orange ink. You probably shouldn't run your pens through acrylic ink while they're wet because the acrylic is like a plasticizer. So it would probably ruin your tip of your pen if you let it dry on there. But if you scribble everything off really quickly, I find that it's not bad. But don't tell anyone I told you to do that because I don't want you to ruin your supplies and blame me. I am, um, I don't mind sacrificing in the name of trying to figure out what we can do. So let me do it on your behalf. <laughs> um, but I had a good time finding that out. Ultimately, it led me to kind of put together this little illustration and I did decide to go from start to finish with it just one little part of it just to see if this is the direction I wanted to go in. I had a pretty good idea that this is what I might want to do for my piece for Halloween this year. So I'll let you just have a look at our little experimentation. I'll be back in a second to chat through more of it. Once all of the experimentation was done on the page, I did have a pretty good idea of where I wanted to go with my final piece, but as with all of these experimentations, and especially when I'm using a limited palette, um, I'm never quite sure if it's going to turn out the way I think it will, and usually I don't mind. I will problem solve along the way, but for this I was planning a pretty big sketch that was very involved, so I wanted to make sure I ran through the process at least once and finished a little portion of that image so that I could get the vibe for where I was going to end up by the end of the piece. And I was really happy with that little flower that I finished in the bottom, oh, I guess it's the bottom, but in the middle of the page there, but it's on the left-hand side of that arrangement. I was really happy with that. So that's where I thought, you know what? I'm gonna apply that technique, that layering style, that, you know, even the scribbly, sketchy line style, all of it, I'm gonna apply that to my finished piece. And that way it gives me just a bit more of a direction and I don't feel like I could spend two hours drawing something and then hate how I painted it. <laughs> so, I mean, that happens sometimes. So usually I will just take a go at finishing one little section to make sure that I can apply that same style to the whole piece. So some of you watching may feel like this piece looks a little familiar and I am here to out myself. Yes, I copied my same piece from last year. <laughs> well, I didn't copy it. I kind of elaborated on it, uh, but it is very, 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 very derivative of a lesson that I taught in a workshop last year. We, um, to cut a long story short, we did a virtual workshop and it was all inspired by Tim Burton, his art style, his like all of his creative uh, pursuits and also uh, movies that he directed as far as theming goes. So it was really, really fun deep dive into everything Tim Burton. I had an absolute blast and learned so much just through going, uh, going through that process. But we also had lots of activities and lessons and one of them was the Japanese art of flower arranging. And we illustrated these floral arrangements that had these kind of sinister looking flowers that were all inspired by something we feel like Tim Burton would draw. Uh, we were really trying to put ourselves in that headspace. <laughs> so these are the flowers from that lesson. And instead of just doing really simplistic kind of abstract Ikebana type arrangements, I wanted to do a massive full page spread of all of these flowers so I could give them all their moment to shine. So this is where that is from. And if you feel like it looked familiar, yes, you have good eyes and a good memory because that's where it's from. At the start, I thought, oh, I shouldn't do this. I should do something different. But you know what? It's really not reflective of who I am as an artist. I am always repeating things. I am always trying something I've done before and trying it 55 more times. So I did want to make sure that that was something I mentioned because even in my head, like as far as making a video goes, sometimes I even think like it's got to be new and it's got to be something someone's never seen before. I don't necessarily think that's true. I think it's enough to look at things that you've done in the past that you've really enjoyed and have another go at them. It's been a year since I had a go at this and I enjoyed it just as much now, if not more than when I did it the first time because it's had a year to kind of sit in the background. My skills have also developed since then and now I'm doing it in this challenging way where I can only use a limited amount of supplies. 
all of those different factors change the experience for you. So I think it is actually a really good part of people's creative journey to revisit parts of their past and try it again. It can be very validating to kind of demonstrate to yourself your growth and how far you've come since then. As far as the style of this piece goes, I wanted to mention some of the things that I think will help if you're looking to recreate this effect. The first thing I did was draw everything out in pencil, just lightly. I kind of marked where I wanted everything to go. There was not a lot of detail to my sketch and that's more so I'm doing composition. I'm not actually trying to draw detail. I'm just trying to compose where I want my flowers, how big they're going to be, and kind of fill the whole page. The next thing I did was line it all with a, I think it was a 05 pen. It was quite a thick pen, and then erased all of the pencil lines underneath. Now I'm at the stage where I grabbed the smallest pen, the 005, and I'm adding really scribbly, sketchy details to everything. I'm almost doing another outline, but just slightly inside all of my uh, all of my illustrations and I'm adding little scribbles and sketches kind of strategically so it looks like I've sketched it but in reality I am just adding that in afterwards it helps to really add because it looks kind of wonky like when you look at how I sketched it I used a bit of a shaky hand to do it to give it this really loose you know, sketchy look, but when you erase all of those lines, it actually just looks like you tried to draw it neat and it didn't work. <laughs> so I have to add those sketchy lines back in so that people know it was intentional. And that's that process. The next one I'm kind of, uh, I guess you could say shadowing. I'm putting this layer of shadow underneath by sketching pencil where I want all my shadows. And then I use the tip of my finger just to blend that into the page. Usually your fingers have got some oils on them. So just give them a bit of a wipe before you do that because this next step of applying this, you know, quote unquote watercolor that we've made, uh, it could act as a resist if you've got any oils that transfer onto the page. The next step was to take those little watercolors that we made. These were all the watered mixes, especially the orange. It was watered down quite a bit. I wanted to be very strategic with where I placed the brightest part of the orange because it would really pop. So this first layer is more like a wash. Everything gets a bit of the orange, a bit of the green, and a bit of that mix, that uh, secondary mix between both of them, that brown olive color. And this was just a nice way to bring some color to the whole piece. It kind of worked for me because not only is the orange kind of representative of Halloween, but it was a nice, I want to say warm, it almost looks cool because it's fluorescent, but it was a nice mix between having something that was colorful and then the green having something that was quite natural, even though that green was actually a bit bright. Um, but it kind of worked to reference the leaves, obviously, and the stems and vines. So it had that natural element to it, as well as the really bright poppy punch of orange. You can see I've just added those orange parts into places I wanted to highlight. So some of that stem, those black and white striped stems, and the cheeks. I wanted to add some in the cheeks just because I thought it would pop them out really cute. And then I'm going over again with another layer of pencil, deepening up any of those areas I wanted to have a bit of an extra dark shadowing. This is just layer upon layer upon layer and a very, uh, a very typical look of how I will create a lot of my mixed media pieces. This is completely optional, of course, but I do like to fill an entire page. If I set out to fill something, I mean, every nook and cranny is going to get an illustration. But to make the leaves in the background, I wanted to flesh it all out, but I didn't want it to be so uh, distracting from the piece that I'd already drawn. So I actually didn't line them. I just went straight in with the green. And can you see how they kind of softly fade into the background? I think that's a much easier way to kind of fill out a whole piece without actually distracting yourself from everything else. Because if you could just imagine a black outline around every single one of those leaves, I think it would be a little bit much. And the last part I'm going to do is add any extra little details I feel like could just bring a little, a little something to the piece. So here is my originally Tim Burton inspired and then my derivative work of that <laughs> version of a Halloween floral arrangement, a big, big full page spread of creepy cute 
kind of sinister looking uh, flowers there. I also wanted to give you another fun fact if you've uh, never thought about this before, it kind of relates, this being all flowers, right? Um, Halloween falls in spring in Australia, so being a uh, celebrating Halloween in the fall was actually kind of new for me when I moved to a country where the, <laughs> the seasons were flipped. So if you never thought about that before, uh, perhaps you could think about giving your Halloween themed art a bit of a spring twist in honor of Australia <laughs> and other countries who have their seasons flipped. But I thought that was just an interesting thing to think about. I'll see you for the outro in a second. There we go, all finished, my Tim Burton inspired flower arrangement for Halloween 2021. I hope you enjoyed watching that. If you would like to join Art Snacks, you can use the code JAMES10 at checkout for 10% off. And also don't forget to share your work with us using the hashtag Art Snacks Challenge in the mixed community and on social media. We love to see it. Stay safe, have a happy Halloween everyone, and until next time, bye.